Good afternoon, this is Westminster News. I'm Fan Wang, and here are the headlines. Chaos continues for commuters as we approach the afternoon rush hour. The government debates the situation in Aleppo and what more can be done to ease pressures. Christmas is fast approaching, so we ask students what their favorite holiday traditions are. Passengers' misery is said to continue as Southern Rail operator Galvia Tapslink failed to stop the strike action last week. The rail operator has told passengers not to travel, but commuters are at breaking point. Ely Williams reports. Today is not your typical morning rush hour at Victoria Station, with little happening. Around 300,000 commuters who depend on southern trains have been advised not to travel. Getting to and from work has become intolerable for many passengers. Um, I've had to stay at work, I've had to sleep in my workplace, which is frankly unhealthy. <laughs> I shouldn't have to do that. Um, it's not good for my social life either. I'm not able to go out and see friends easily because I'm stuck at, in my place of work. And for those students needing to get to class, the bus is the only option. Yeah, there was massive delays from our overground stations. So that means we had to go to Brixton. Um, but there, there was loads of traffic and there was loads of people queuing up. So we had to like, find like, different routes, which is quite difficult. Um, and now we're late for our college. So. The rail unions have been accused of having little interest in resolving the southern dispute over driver-only operated trains. But some members of the public are sympathetic to their cause. Well, I believe that everybody has his a security at mind, the government as well as the unions, etc., that everybody is working for the greater public, uh, that it has just become too complicated, and that we are, as the public, the suffering party in this. But we have to consider also the working staff and their requirements. I spoke to uh, Mr. Vijay Singh, who is part of operations management, who has said it is beyond frustration um, and passengers are actually, he's very concerned for his platform staff members who have been regularly receiving verbal and physical abuse. He tells me that passengers are actually losing it and tells me of a particular incident where one of his staff members was nearly throttled and the passenger had to be um, escorted off in tears of anger and frustration. As a result, the, they have had to increase British Transport Police um, both at London Bridge and Victoria. This is Elu Williams reporting from Victoria. Today, hundreds of thousands of commuters are suffering massive disruption as three days of strikes began on Southern Rail. But not only passengers are affected. Businesses are seeing a loss of customers. Minha Gao has the report. It's the first day of the three-day long industrial action and now we're outside the Victoria Station. And Southern Rail has already warned passengers not to travel today because there's strike and also the driver strikes will be next week and into New Year. And the driver strikes will affect almost 300,000 passengers. But as you can see, there's still people managing to get to their work because there's still some local service. But inside the train station, there is no train at all between Brighton and uh, London. But passengers are not the only one who have been affected. Businesses are also suffering. So I've spoken to some businesses uh, inside the station who apparently couldn't uh, leave their uh, shop. But they have told me that they are sympathetic to passengers, but there's no business. What can they do? Especially those businesses situated close to platform 18. There is no uh, customer for them. So the misery for passengers and uh, uh, businesses are going to continue over the next few days. This is Ming Hao Gao, Westminster News. Train drivers from Aslif and the RMT who are striking today have a very different perspective to commuters. Drivers are citing safety concerns as the primary reason for the strike. They claim the combination of the proposed driverless trains and growing passenger numbers will make it impossible to safety and safely close train doors. Train drivers are hoping that the proposed of 
the proposal of driverless trains will be reconsidered. Mayor of London Sadiq Khan has condemned inaction by the government in combating the recent rail strikes. He said he was successful in stopping the planned tube strike last week. The government needs to do the same. Naira Mamo has the story. On the first day of the southern rail strikes, commuters having experimented with issues until now due to citizens deciding to stay at home as the rail company advised yesterday. Today, the mayor of London has blamed the government for failing commuters. On a video published on his Twitter account, Mr. Khan has called to people to send their complaints to the Secretary of Transport, Chris Grayling. He's also stated that he wants to control some lines. Since I became mayor, the number of days lost to strikes in the underground has reduced by 92%. Commuters get a better service when we engage. This is yet another reason why the government should give TfL control of commuter lines like Southern, Southeastern and Southwest. You'd get a more frequent and reliable service under TfL with fewer strikes. The declarations of the Mayor of London on his Twitter account leaves just one question. Who the commuters want to rule over the train network? TfL or the Southern Rail Services? Nayara Marmon, Westminster News. The UN Human Rights Office says it has reliable evidence that 82 civilians were shot on site. Rebels who have held eastern Aleppo for the past four years are on the brink of defeat. Syrian pro-government forces have been entering homes and killing those inside, including women and children. The UN has appealed to Syria and Russia to end the attacks and allow civilians to safely flee the area. Our reporter Bria Woods was outside the, the House of Commons where an emergency debate has been organized. There are calls for the government to do more to try and secure a ceasefire. The House of Commons held a two-hour emergency debate this afternoon to discuss the dire humanitarian crisis in eastern Aleppo. Andrew Mitchell, former International Development Secretary, called for the debate, saying Aleppo now resembles Stalingrad at the end of its destruction. Syrian regime forces have captured 90% of the contested territory and are continuing to attack civilians. There are reports that Assad's regime have used sarin and chlorine bombs. Andrew Mitchell urges the House of Commons to consider what role the international community plays in saving those who live in such dreadful jeopardy. Mitchell is calling for the House to take immediate action to evacuate remaining doctors, nursing staff and hundreds of civilians that remain in the war-torn area. Bria Woods, Westminster News, Parliament. For the seventh consecutive year, house prices are set to rise. In 2017, house prices in London could increase by up to 10%. Our reporter Shiksha Arora has a story. The analysis of house figures by Civitas found that construction was lowest in high growth areas. Young families are being forced to move to suburbs to find homes which are not expanding at the rate needed to meet the high demand. London is headed for the highest growth in population in the coming years and the housing and residential development is not ready for it. David Bentley, the editorial director of Civitas, talks about some of the major problems faced by the housing sector. Housing supply is running at about 90% of the number of homes that we would need to keep up with household growth. In London it's much worse, it's about 55%. So that was the first big, um, that, that was an eye-opener to say the least. But then be, within that you've also got a problem that many of the areas within London are even worse than that. A lot of the outer boroughs um, which are hemmed in by the green belt are managing uh, probably a third of the housing supply that they really need to get on top of household formation. There could be major long-term implications experienced by many young families and adults as they are unable to find affordable homes. Daniel highlights how the undersupply affects Londoners. The city is going to become more and more expensive, so younger people, perhaps graduating at the universities, um, are probably going to find when they get to their um, mid-twenties, they might not be able to afford to live here, to pursue careers here. Young adults may need to find comfort on their parents' sofa as the home shortage proves to be a growing crisis in the capital. For those who don't already own a home in London, there might be disastrous consequences in future on affordability. Shiksha Arora, Westminster News. Post office workers are set to stage a five-day strike in the days leading up to Christmas.
It will start on December the 19th and last until Christmas Eve. Gifts and cards should be delayed after staff at 300 UK post offices go on strike. The communication workers the Communications Workers Union said a deep city dispute over jobs, pensions, and branch closures is behind the walkout. It's not all doom and gloom for real passengers. Earlier this month, the London mayor announced 30 stations will get step-free access in a five-year investment plan across the London underground. Claudia Blob was at Hair on the Hill this morning, one of the stations that will receive the investment, to see how the change will affect commuters. Taking the stairs will soon not be the only option in and out of the Hair on the Hill tube station. The £200 million investment plan Sadikan proposed will make this and 29 other stations more convenient for commuters. And luckily for Hero residents, this station is on top of the list. I talked to Navin Shan, a London Assembly member for Brenton Harrow, who has led the work to making this station step free. It's taken nearly 10 years to get to a commitment from the Mayor of London uh, last week. He said that this station is becoming a transport interchange hub in the centre of Harrow. They are expecting several thousand homes to be built and a growing economy. Therefore, making it accessible is an integral part of this development. And residents couldn't agree more. I think it's a wicked idea. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It should have happened years ago because the thing is, people are not taking the tube because they're not able to do it because of the stairs. People temporarily disabled and on crutches, etc., might be using uh, wheelchairs or they might be using crutches. So if a step free access is there, it's, it's, it's sort of a trip hazard if, if there's a step. So, you know, that could be eliminated as well. I heard you say that it's going to be convert for disabled people. I can't visualize it, how it can be done, but there is always a possibility. I asked Mr. Shah the same question. How will it be done? The, the preferred scheme involves five lifts, three which will be on the platforms and, and two at each end at the shopping center end and one at the back. One at the back will be subject to other development which is being planned. But this is part of a major uh, regeneration project because phase one will have access improved with lifts to this station. It's about 20 million worth of project, by the way. There are 270 underground stations in London, but only 70 of them are step free. And as for when the Harrow on the Hill station will be complete, it's still in discussion. Those are the details which we will be looking at in the new year. But as far as I'm concerned, people of Harrow are concerned, it cannot happen uh, soon enough. And until then, many will still rely on the kindness of the commuters. Claudia Balog, Westminster News, Harrow. NHS inquiry has found that hospitals are leaving families in the dark when treating their beloved ones. The Care Quality Commission has condemned the system-wide failures in all hospitals. Our reporter Pawan Dita Sanj has more. Out of 27 death reports being investigated, only two had a satisfactory standard. The NHS have found a string of problems which trusts are immediately defensive about. A study has shown that not all deaths are being investigated properly and families are being left to suffer. There are also concerns that they are not being involved during the investigation process. Families have told the CQC that they received a lack of respect, honesty and sensitivity. What this means is that hospitals are not learning from their mistakes which could have prevented a majority of tragedies. Pound it with and Westminster News. Long before Black Friday, Boxing Day sales have been a staple of the British High Street. However, this tradition is under threat from Parliament. Jack Maggett has a story. Yesterday evening in Parliament, there was a debate to determine whether large shops should be allowed to open their doors to the public on Boxing Day. An online petition which called for shops to remain closed the day after Christmas reached well over the 100,000 signatures needed to trigger a parliamentary response. The Roberts family enjoy shopping in the post-Christmas period. We're very impressed with the, um, the festive feel of the city and we're looking forward to doing some more shopping in the next week or so. 
During the debate, Labour MPs backed the call to postpone the post-Christmas sale to the 27th. However, the government stated that it did not believe it was their role to tell businesses how to best serve their customers. Jamie Hutchinson is a high street shopper who supports the government's stance. Most people do a lot of their shopping then. That's probably, for merchants, it's probably their high time, right? So you'd be killing the merchants. Boxing Day means many different things to people. For some, it is an opportunity to nurse their Christmas hangovers and polish off whatever remains of the mince pies. For others, it is a rare opportunity to spend time with their families, a day which should not be hijacked by corporate or retail greed. However, yesterday's debate was more than a discussion about family values. It was a debate about whether governments really have the right to tell businesses what to do and how to best serve their customers. This is Jack Meggett reporting from Westminster. The FA's plan to encourage girls to participate in sport has received a negative response. A 10-year-old girl claimed the FA, the FA thinks they are brainless, Barbie, the brainless baby Barbies. Stephen Atwell has more. The Football Association has faced criticism from pupils at a school in County Durham for a document they created giving advice on how to get more girls involved in sport. The suggestions laid out in the report included offering girls colourful, nice-smelling bibs and pink whistles. It also suggested advertising in, quote, places where girls go, like coffee shops and on the back of toilet doors. Teachers and pupils at the school found the document both laughable and insulting. Dunham Women's FC player Helen Alderson says she is disappointed in the naivety of the FA. The FA say the document was created following research and feedback. They went on to reiterate their commitment to doubling female participation by 2020. This is Stephen Atwell reporting for Westminster News. Scientists say they have discovered a clue that could lead them to find traces of astero astero asteroid that hit the Earth 66 million years ago. 75% of all life, not just dinosaurs, became extinct as a result. After weeks of drilling in Mexico, they reached rocks that show how life began to recover. Scientists hope they will soon be able to explain why the events are so dis cat catastrophic. Christmas is celebrated globally. However, traditions and celebrations change from family to family. Students at the University of Westminster shared about their special Christmas pastimes. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Christmas is right around the corner and with students preparing for finals, everyone's thinking about their favorite traditions. We went to the forum today to talk to students about what their favorite Christmas traditions are. Um, my dad will sit us by the fire and um, will read us um, the night before Christmas. Sounds like a fairy tale. So it sounds really lame, but that's what we do every Christmas Eve. Okay, so over the holiday season, I'd like to go and see family. Um, so I've got family in Essex and I've got family in Manchester as well. So t the most of my time is usually travelling, um, but yeah, I, I enjoy spending time with family. Um, eating a lot of foods um, and catching up on stuff which I've missed over the year with the rest of my family, so yeah, that's not really. Um, I think the only one I can remember is um, just over the festive period, my granddad puts like this big frosty the snowman on the conservatory patio bit and whenever you walk past it, it starts singing. So yeah, that's just there. Christmas, we're f both from Spain, and we um, we meet, everyone gets together, and we have a lot of food, a lot of like t typical Spanish food. But then what we do differently from other countries is that in New Year's. We eat 12 grapes, the 12 seconds before midnight, it's just like one grape per second, and then like just when the clock hits midnight, you it's just the, like it's party. The last one yeah, it's the last grape. You're like, yeah. Not full of Spinning all the grapes, but you have to eat them because if not, it's bad luck. Yeah, so that's basically the most typical tradition in Spain, yeah. I think it's being together as a family and, you know, sitting around the table, eating, having Christmas crackers and, you know, the whole shebang. <laughs> Thank you for watching Westminster News. Have a good evening.